Hi, this is Jamie Coots, Director of the CMT Association at the annual symposium. I'm here joined by Wes Gray. Thanks for having me. No problem. Wes, now you started off as a stock picker. Yeah. What was the catalyst that for, caused you to move towards more of a quantitative approach to the markets? Pretty, pretty much losing a lot of money um, and, and you know, believing in, in my own BS too much and then getting the humble pie and realizing that I had to come up with a better approach that was more systematic, less about my gut instinct, and just I had to go go quant, <laughs> basically. Right. Losing too much money. Right. Um, well, if, um, if you uh, use a quantitative uh, approach, I mean, as a PhD, that obviously yeah. goes with a lot of training and intensive background and research. Yeah. For aspiring traders and investors these days, do they yeah. need to have that kind of rigorous background in order to employ a quantitative strategy? Not really. I mean, honestly, we consider ourselves kind of fundamental quants where we just use quantitative tools to maintain the discipline associated with some kind of core principles or fundamental ideas. Which, and really what that means is you just need to know economics, mm -hmm. you know, human psychology, and then you have to have a capability <clears throat> to you know, manage data and, and work with it, which usually means you gotta have some level of technical skills, mm. but you could go watch a bunch of YouTube videos and have more technical skills than a PhD in computer science these days. So right. um, it, it's not really a requirement. You just gotta know how to do the work. Mm. Um, now where PhD or CMT or any of these credentials come in is to the extent that you need to portray credibility to like you know, an audience or for capital raising or what have you. It's just, it's nice to have the, the rubber stamp of approval, but from a knowledge functional basis, you could have a high school degree right. and be an amazing quant, right. um, for sure. You mentioned, so. uh, you mentioned behavioral finance. So yeah. That's a big part, and I've, I've heard you speak about uh, system one errors and removing that from the process. Yeah. So obviously the CMT program is very heavily tilted towards behavioral finance and understanding biases, yeah. but uh, that was obviously a big revelation for you in your yeah, approach. Yeah, and, and like I said, like at the outset, I, I live that. Like, you know, I, I knew about behavioral biases, but when you do stock picking and you're not using a, a system, you, you generally, even though you're aware of the problems, you suffer from the problems, mm. unless you're Warren Buffett, I guess. Um, so yeah, I, I think understand your own biases and then deploying these quantitative systematic systems, it's just, they're not perfect, but at least they prevent the system one errors of you know you being a human, basically. Right. Um, and for me, that, that's worth a lot. Right. Uh, so, so that's why I like quant, but it's not for everyone either. Sure. Um, I think uh, listening to you yesterday was um, was quite fascinating. You've got an approach which is um, melding fundamental and technical quantitative approaches together yeah. to form a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, now there seems to be this uh, evolution of um, new factors every single day. Yeah. Um, what's your thoughts on some of these newer factors that we're seeing in the marketplace? Um, I mean, to be honest, like. I think the factors that are established, robust, all these sort of things are already well well known. You know, value, buy cheap stuff, momentum, buy relative strength, trend falling, like ideas that have been around for, you know, decades or possibly centuries. The the newer ones I think are potentially interesting, but the issue is are they robust or are they just data mining and optimization mm -hmm. and a sales pitch? And I, I would just be very skeptical of quote unquote new ideas because it's not like people haven't been trying to you know make money doing systematic strategies for a long time and so the things that will work I, in my opinion are open secrets mm. and they work for reasons that are grounded in you know fundamentals or dynamics of supply demand and so new factors uh, I think is there's a very high probability that it's a, a new data mining operation right um, that, that it's just not stable would be my uh, that, that would be okay. my initial instinct on all new factors basically um, if you had to pick one factor or if you're on an investment island stranded yeah. and you had to pick one what would it be momentum um, value yeah I, I've, I've I've actually been asked this before and and so if I was a rational like totally evidence-based person momentum would be the factor but okay. it, as, as you probably know and a lot of people know it's not about the data all the time a lot of times it's also behavioral and what can you stick with 
and, and I'd say at the margin, if you know, momentum's in a 10 year drought, value's in a 10 year drought, just because I'm just fundamentally, I, I originally started as a value person, mm. I, I, would, I would stick with value until I lost every damn dollar, because we're, we're, it's just I believe in it a little bit more. But rationally, I should be a momentum person because it does right. have better evidence for it. Um, but I just, it's, it still freaks me out uh, because that, that, it's not as intuitive and, uh, yeah, where, where values just make sense. Buy cheap stuff everybody hates, and over a long haul, you get to make a little extra money. It just makes sense to me. Um, well, it seems that both of those um, factors actually complement each other. So yeah. putting them together make a lot of sense, and you've talked about that sure. in great detail. Yeah. Um, what's quite interesting, though, is the, uh, the momentum industry uh, mm -hmm. and the way it's been marketed and some of the things that you've shown here at this conference yeah. about how actually it's uh, most of those momentum strategies, the ETF products that are out there, um, very much mimic a market cap or a market index type strategy with very little momentum tilt. Yeah. So there's obviously, in your eyes, a great opportunity for momentum strategies to exist in the marketplace without actually crowding out or arbitraging away those, uh, I, those I opportunities. Think so. Um, a, a lot of the quote unquote momentum strategies, to, to your point, are es essentially closet indexes, which is fine. They may be fulfilling a different mission mm. than wanting to you know, buy high octane momentum for that client base, but that also is not going to be very exploitative of the momentum factor if really there's a small amount of capital that's actually dedicated to arbitraging that component. So to the extent that you, you want to go much more concentrated. Um, you don't see a lot of those products out there. Um, so I think there is opportunities for people that, you know, get, have a client base that understands what they're buying. Mm. Because obviously if you buy concentrated factor products, they, they act very differently than the S&P 500. Um, and to the extent people are on board with that idea, it's great. To right. the extent they don't really understand it, it's terrible because when it goes bad, they liquidate, yeah. um, and you kind of defeating the whole purpose of being a disciplined momentum investor when right. you're always selling and buying at the wrong time. So, which um, comes back to the uh, behavioral finance yeah. aspect of it all. Yeah, right. Pretty much, yeah. It, it all. It's the like I more of been doing this. I used to think you had to be a quant, a PhD, and prove you know every equation on the planet. But uh, maybe I'm just getting old. But I, I think uh, John Bolger had a great comment about first principles the other day. Yeah. It's, it's, in the end, it's all about the, the fundamental building blocks, knowing psychology. It, it's just basics. And you don't need to complicate your systems or your models that much as long as you're on what he called first principles or like mm. core ideas. Right, right. Um, but people get so wrapped around the axle on the details. Like, well, my momentum does this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't realize they're just going down the data mining optimization trap. Right. Um, when in the end, you could have just thrown a dart at any kind of momentum-esque strategy. Yeah. And essentially achieve, over the long haul, the same end state. Right. Um, and any differences are just going to be noise anyways. Well, that's what so, I've enjoyed about reading your material and seeing you here at the conference is actually that uh, reaffirmation of the fact that momentum does work. It's been shown to work over very long periods of time um, and oh, yeah. there's many different ways to capture that factor yeah. but ultimately it is one of the strongest if not the strongest factor in the marketplace yeah, yeah. without a doubt yeah. um, you, you got to make sure you can do it after fees and frictional costs and do it right but yeah. it, it's it's certainly uh, the most compelling factor out there from a database uh, standpoint right so well great so thank you very much for being here yeah. this year and this is Jamie Coots from the CMT Association Symposium for 2018.